Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful night of poetry reading with the Windfall Poetry Series. Uh, my name is Wendy, and I work at the Public Library. Perhaps you've seen me downtown, and we're in for just such a treat tonight. We have two outstanding poets, and um, it's just going to be a wonderful evening. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I wanted to do just a couple things really quickly before we introduce Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild. Uh, the first thing is that if you have any questions whatsoever, let me put this up right now. You are welcome to email me. There I am. You can do this a couple different ways. So this is streaming right now on YouTube and you are welcome to put in your comments right down below the stream. And we will um, have a Q&A at the end of the poetry session. So that will be fantastic. You can ask our poets any questions about their craft. Another option, of course, is to email me. So you don't have to go through YouTube. You can email me at wbeck at eugene-or.gov and I will check my email throughout the evening and I can ask your questions for you at the end of the reading. Uh, so that's one thing. I also wanted to give my heartfelt thanks to the, um, to the Lane Literary Guild, which uh, Henry Alley is a part of. Without them, this would not be possible. So thank you for that. Also, thank you so much to the friends of the Eugene Public Library. They are instrumental in getting all these programs out to people and patrons and community members. And um, we're very grateful for that as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild. Hello, Henry. Hello, thank you, Wendy. And it's a real privilege to be speaking tonight, and I am so happy to be here. And I want to tell you that the Lane Literary Guild has been around since 1984 when I joined it. And it has been a very primary part of the literary arts here in Eugene, Oregon. And it has featured writers from not only our region, but throughout different parts of the United States. Uh, we have run a series like this for many years. The Windfall series specifically started in around the mid uh, 1990s. And I'm just very happy that we have been able to encourage the writing of nonfiction, fiction, poetry throughout all these years. And tonight is a very special night for me because I'm being able to introduce two wonderful friends who I've known for three decades and uh, Diane Dugas and Amanda Wright Howell. And tonight, um, our first reader will be Diane. And Diane Dugas, a scholar, teacher, folk singer, and creative writer, has brought English and folklore at the university, has taught English and folklore at the University of Oregon, Harvard, University of Colorado, and UCLA, and performed at colleges, libraries, conferences, and festivals in the US, Canada, and Mexico. She's recorded two musical CDs and penned songs, stories, a memoir in progress, and more than 50 articles and four scholarly books on historical topics, including cross-dressing women, um, women heroes, and the origins of musical comedy. Her creative stories have appeared in such magazines as Blue Line, Slippery Elm, Mount Hope, and others. On her CD, Dangerous Examples, Fighting and Sailing Women in Song, she sang ballads from her book, Warrior Women and Popular Balladry. That's 1650 to 1850 University of Chicago Press. She says, my ranch childhood in Pacific Northwest, a large musical family and early convent experience propel my passion for storytelling, for women heroes and for the culture, history and stories of the past. Her recent historical essay, Transcendent Ephemera, Deep Structure in Elegies, Ballads, and Other Occasional Forms, appears in the current issue of 18th Century Life. Diane lives in Eugene, Oregon, with her wife of more than 30 years, Amanda Powell. And I just want to say I have been privileged to witness her reading of a story in the For the Lane Literary Guild, very scintillating story, and to also have read her story in A Slippery Elm. They're all very vibrant and encourage, encourage me to enter her world. And so without further ado, I introduce my friend, Diane Dugas. 
Thank you, Hank. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you, Wendy, who was in a class of mine a while ago. And it's wonderful to be here. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, I, I want to thank the Lane Literary Guild and the Writers Network and the Eugene Public Library. And, uh, and Hank, thank you. And I have a few poems and stories. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's out, out there listening to my stories and poems. And I'm going to, to I've, I've, had a, I've had a rough year. We've had, we've had a rough year. And so I, I've chosen, um, I've chosen poems and stories from my memoir collection that um, is, a, is called On Cowlitz Prairie. And it's about growing up the oldest of 12 kids in a rambunctious family on a ranch up by Mount St. Helens. So I'll, I'll start with a poem, which is a kind of prayer in a way, as it remembers, it remembers a time before there were so many dams. And so it's a prayer for it, for our rebuilding, our, 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 our managing our rivers so the fish can come back. But this is, this is a poem called Bringing Summer. One day in late spring, they arrive all of a sudden, hurrying home to the high mountains from the Pacific. Little smelt in the millions roil and wriggle their way up our river toward the snowy cascades. They flicker the whole river, black to silver, black to silver, black to silver. Glinting and gleaming, they swim up the Columbia, past Stillwaco, Chinook, Skamakaway, turn into the Cowlitz at Kelso, then come along by Castle Rock and on up the river past us. The smelt are running, the smelt are running. The whole breathing Cowlitz passes by, a finny swim of black. The squirming carpet stretches in all directions, bank to bank and up and down, as far as you can see. You want to take off your shoes. Step right off the muddy bank. Cross over on their small, sleek, sparkling backs. Walk out on that eager, mysterious ribbon of fish. So, um, there's some good news about fish. There's a lot of bad news about fish, including the little smelt. They haven't run for about five years that I know of, but it's just been uh, happening that the, um, the Indian tribes in Washington have been working to revive the spawning of the salmon. And for the first time in 80 years, salmon are spawning in the upper reaches of the Columbia River. So it's pretty exciting. So now I want to read uh, a story that is from this memoir that I have kind of going on about growing up in this wonderfully beautiful prairie country up by Mount St. Helens on a little ranch. And, and the way this uh, is written, it's, it's a kind of coming of age and the narrator is telling 
about all of the relationships and the people and the animals and the different creatures that make up this world. So this one is about the mother. It's called Bug Guns. In the middle of winter, the choir loft under the bell tower at the Mission Church must be the warmest spot on the prairie because it has flies when anywhere else there's not a fly to be seen. At least one of us kids stands guard when my mother plays the organ for Advent and Christmas because old flies hanging on after summer's long gone wake up. When the hymns sing out, these leftovers drift groggily down from the bell tower and land on stuff in the loft. Benches, books, kneelers. But they especially go for the organ. Flop down like their wings and legs don't work and then bounce crazily on the white keys. It drives my mother nuts. The last thing I need when I'm at the organ is to have to swat away these infernal flies. From All Saints Day in November, this can carry on past Christmas if we've had no hard frosts. The bug guns are a new invention my mother found in the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Pistol-like, they have a trigger and a barrel with a round nose piece at one end, flat as a pancake and made of lacy, stiff plastic webbing. This nifty mustard yellow spring-loaded doily shoots out when you pull the trigger. A string about two feet long connects the doily disc to the gun barrel, so nobody has to chase it down after it shoots at a fly. If a person's any good at it, the doily disc never hits the floor or anything else but the target bug. Take aim, time it perfectly, and you can pop off one of those loopy flies in midair before it gets to the keyboard, preferable to hitting them on the organ where it would be noticeable smack in the middle of say, hail holy queen enthroned above or O come, O come, Emmanuel. My mom's organ playing is pure professional. She sits on that high bench at the back of church like a Wells Fargo wagon driver ready to deliver the mail. Glancing over the balcony rail of the loft to the parishioners and priest below, she can tell exactly when each hymn needs to start and how long it has to go in order to fit to its part in the mass or until everyone's out the door at the end. Flies on the keyboard can make things go wrong. The long ropes from the bell tower dangle and sway behind the organ when mom blasts a hymn and she goes about it like nobody's business. The flies drop down from somewhere up there Mom has her hymn books opened to the proper pages and stacks them on top of the organ just right. Her left hand holds chords from the end of whatever hymn we're in, keeping the suspense until her right, quick as a frog's tongue, flips aside the present book to the one below and she's into the new hymn without a hitch. As today's mass ends and we're set for the final hymn, Mom's chords make it perfectly clear. You will sing, holy God, we praise thy name soon. Then after the lead in, her hands and feet lift off the organ for that flashing silence that says, sing, holy God, we praise thy name now. We all crash together on the first line, the organ, my mom riding on straight ahead and the whole church of 40 or 50 singers ambling along behind to bring our mass to its close. Uh-oh, 
One of those goofy flies flops onto mom's hymn book stacked above the keyboard. The timing now is everything. I've got the gun ready and nod the signal to Terry. Get it up in the air, I mouth silently. Poised with a St. Teresa holy card from her missile, Terry stands ready as I cock the trigger, the fly wiggling around and threatening to flop off the books and onto the keyboard. Here we are, smack in the middle of, holy God, we praise thy name. In these situations, it's important to intercept the flies while the church singing and organ are at full blast, so as to cover up a noisy miss, an accidentally falling hymn book, or any other kind of ruckus. We're experienced, and we're ready. As the singing of Holy God We Praise is blasting out, the trigger cocks just right. Terry's holy card flicks that poor fly into the air, and I pull the trigger at the singing roar of thy name. Perfect. The plastic doily whacks the bug in midair, then falls to slap the corner of the organ, absolutely unnoticed as praise thy name echoes through the mission. Proud and relieved, Terry and I join along in the singing. So, so that's about church going. And a lot of what I like to write about is ironic juxtapositions. Anyway, and as I say, I, I also wanted to read some stories that are fun. So the next one that I'm going to read is called Fishing Hole. And this story was published a few years ago in a wonderful magazine from Whidbey Island that's called Soundings. So this is Fishing Hole. Paul is almost five. He's small for his age, like all of us, with red hair and freckles, like most of us. But usually he's into more trouble than the rest. He teases Joe and Terry till they scream. When he was two or three, he beat my birthday puppy on the head with his wooden hammer until she got mean and bit so many kids that we had to give her to Mr. Pendergrass one of dad's old man patients who lives alone across the river with no kids anywhere near. Paul is always climbing on top of something and falling off. He split his lip open so many times it's grown extra padding on the top and the bottom both. When the creek in the lower field starts running in the winter and spring and Paul goes down there for hours and fishes for rags. Everybody's relieved. It'll be early in the morning after a rain with the creek high and the sun just up behind the mountain. Everybody knows that's when fish bite. His red hunting hat bobs above the tall grass as he heads off for the field, the brim pulled down over his ears. Tweety trots beside him, her tail whisking above the reedy stalks. Over his shoulder, Paul carries his special fishing pole, a broomstick with some wrapping twine dangling from one end finished off with a diaper pin. He carries a yellow bucket with small rags, bits of sleeves and cuffs and collars. Kid socks are best. Paul and Tweety make their way to the lower pasture. He climbs the wooden fence rung by rung, careful to manage his bucket and pole. Tweety gives the fence a once over then slithers under the bottom rung. 
From the kitchen window, you can see Paul's fishing hole halfway down the field, where the creek tumbles over a rocky ledge. A little waterfall, eight or nine inches, splashes into a muddy bowl with circling water too deep for weeds to take hold. The frogs love it there, croaking away mornings and evenings. After churning in the little hole, the creek spills out the downside to travel through the field again, thickets and cattails on either bank. Finally, at the far end, it sloshes into the ditch near the giant oak at the edge of the road. Reaching their spot below the little falls and setting the fishing pole down, Paul and Tweety then march further upstream. The more it rains, the faster the water runs, rushing down from Mr. Raup's rolling hill and the limp straggles of last year's wheat. As the top of our field, at the top of our field, where the creek first enters by the bar barbed wire fence, Paul reaches into the yellow bucket and drops his rags one by one into the water. Terry's unlost plaid sock what's left of daddy's shirt sleeve and parts of a couple of ties, bits of dish towels, hankies, and raggedy aprons, all hit the water and slither this way and that. Tweety wags and barks as the last of the rags wriggle their way downstream. Then Paul grabs the bucket, presses his red hat to his head and races down along the creek to where his pole is waiting beside the falls and the splashing pool. He points and Tweety sits. He sets the bucket at the edge, turns it over, makes sure it's solid on the bank, picks up his fishing pole and takes a seat, his boots barely reaching the ground. He straightens the twine then opens the big diaper pin to exactly the right angle. Lowering the pin on its line into the water, he stares upstream toward the barbed wire fence at the top edge of the field, waiting for the first of his swimming rags to make it over the falls. It can take all morning for the winding stream to carry the socks and cuffs and apron strings twisting in and out of snags and weeds. Eventually, they'll make it all the way over the waterfall to the little pool to get caught by Paul's safety pin and put into his bucket of fish. So the next, um, the next one I want to read is um, is a poem, and it's about um, it's about the way that I like to explore all the different perspectives and the poetics of a place. I like to write about places and all the presences in places. So this is a poem, it's called Conversations. The cattails keep their feet in the ditch water along the road where they live. Their green stalks rustle like they're about to walk away, the whole bunch of them. And their fuzzy heads, taller than we are, bob and wag, hot dogs in brown sweater caps, talking among themselves about the crows on the telephone wires, about the mice and the muskrats in the grass, about the rains about to rain, about us riding our bikes and passing by them along the road on our way home.
So this is, um, we had, we, I'm, uh, there were like 12 kids in our family and, uh, and also horses and cows and sheep and just all kinds of creatures. And so it was a very presence filled world. And it was kind of, it was kind of a time out of time, but I think everyone's childhood works that way. But, um, I was particularly busy with the horses and some of my stories are about the horses, but this is, this is one that's more about their presence in that world. It's called, How Do the Horses Know? The empty logging trucks growl and rumble up the roads from town to the mountains. Rainier, St. Helens, and Adams to the east. Abernathy Mountain and the Coast Range off west. From far off, the trucks look like their hair is wrapped up on top of their heads. And they have rabbit ears poking up on each side of the cab. If we're out riding on the road when they go by, they scare the horses, make them snort and rear and leap into the ditch. Logging trucks roll fast when they're empty and folded up, clinking and clanking. They wind up into the mountains to take down the giant trees all day long. In the afternoons, they grind down, loaded, and slow bringing logs back into town to the mill. Feeding the horses in the morning is peaceful. You barely make out the distant buzz of the trucks climbing the roads. By 6.30, they're way up in the hills farther and farther toward the snowy peaks. The horses don't care a thing about them early in the day here in the pasture. They just want to come to the barn and eat. To feed the horses, get a coffee can from the corner. Reach into the square plywood bin full of oats. Dip your bare hand into the smooth rolling and the sliding tick, tick, tick of kernels. The oats roll along your fingers and your palm. Push your whole hand deep into the smooth bits filling the bin. Feel the oats dribble against your skin and slither back into the box. They're musty and dry like the chit chat of birds in the loft. Get calm, fill up the old coffee can. The sweet dry smell drifts up your nose. Invisible oat smoke, oat steam, oat dust, essence of oat. And the horses? They can't see you slip from the house to the barn. So how do they know when your hand reaches into that bin? How do they know to come hurrying across from the far side of the orchard to that barely sounding tick? of the oats through your fingers. The geldings come first, always on the lookout for feeding time. Then the mares and the youngsters. The Palomino comes last. She's more dignified than the others, elegant, almost not interested. Watch them through the barn window as they make their way, coming across the big field in front of the Mission Church and its apple orchard. Their tails and manes bob in the sunlight, gleaming in a beautiful line.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diane. And thank you for inviting us into your world, which has so many parts and so many uh, scintillating moments. So thanks so much. And again, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Amanda Bright Powell. And Amanda's poems appear in the chapbook Prowler from Furnishing Line Press in anthologies, including From Here We Speak, Oregon Poets, and the <clears throat> and this assignment is so gay, LGBTQ uh, poets on the art of teaching. And it's such journals as Agni, uh, Catamaran, Grab, Grab Creek, Northwest Review, Plowshares, and Sinister Wisdom. Her translations include poetry and prose by 17th century um, Mexican philosopher Sir Juana Anis de la Cruz, um, La Respusta Feminist Press. She has been awarded uh, in an Oregon Literary Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Humanities Grant, and recently the Jabberbock Review, Nancy Hargrove Editor's Prize for Poetry in fall of 2020. Her in-progress translation of novelist Uriel Quesada's Misfortune Let the Cat Out, Costa Rica, received funding from the National Endowment for the Arts. Writing about Prowler, poet Linda Bamber says, Amanda Powell's poems are dark, witty, and intimate, at once autobiographical and formally sophisticated, both deeply embedded in our literary traditions and right on the edge of contemporary poetics." Unquote. Recently retired from teaching as senior uh, lecturer in Spanish literature and translation at the University of Oregon, Amanda lives with her wife, Diana Dugas and Eugene. And I just want to say that Amanda and I go way back and I remember one of our readings that happened in September of 1994 when Marketplace Books existed and I, I loved her poetry then and I still do. And uh, I love her uh, economic and poetic verse, which can just light, light up a whole scene with a phrase. So without further ado, Amanda Powell. Thank you, Hank. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, thank you, Eugene Public Library and uh, Lane Writers Network, um, especially Wendy Beck, and above all, Hank, uh, for organizing this event. And thank you, audience, um, that, whom I can't see, but I feel you're here. and. Uh, and some of you are writing in. So we've got Berkeley and Seattle and Boston and New York City in the house. Um, just, it's really wonderful. Until we can be together. This is a pretty nifty way to meet. I'm gonna begin, um, it has been a difficult year, as Diane said. And I'm beginning um, with hope and remembrance, um, hope, for uh, the event tomorrow that I'm sure is on everybody's mind. Um, and I'm beginning with a poem written by a poet I admire very much, D.P. Powell. She was and is my mother. Uh, this poem recalls in her characteristic minimalist style, the rightness of the Obama inauguration, both the Obama inaugurations. Uh, my mother died in March and she died of the effects of a long uh, time <laughs> with dementia. So it's particularly poignant and important that she wrote about memory. Remember how it felt that morning the President and Mrs. O, January 20th, 2013. My tribute expands to words and more words scratched out in my notebook while we smile along with our, with our icons, reflecting our shining city 
and the way they fit into it. Here's to the success of the event in safety tomorrow and real change. In that spirit, my second poem is called Prayer. If I have anyone praying for me, let it be the junkie, the one who knows nail into the palm what it is to need. Let that one think of me tenderly once for the blood we share, the muscled beat, the loneliness between us. I know water for passes with force through cracks and prayer through brokenness. Then let us stand to our day. I have a few poems I've written about my mother's and the family experience with dementia, something that so many people go through. Um, this one's called Toast. Our mother needs a little help right now, all the time, because of what just happened, which was? And what she was about to do. Hmm. How was it we got here? She asks, looking around her neat house. Excuse me, but when will we be getting home? And so my sister runs downstairs again to check. My brother moves months at a time up from Florida. Quarterly, I fly across to be with her a spell and say, Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Let's eat the toast you already made. Great. There's more over here. And Martine and Susan and Betsy, and then Anne-Marie and Linda also take turns. In the middle, she, of all this business, at the kitchen window, might forget that she always has loved a sunset. But she raises her tea to point. Will you look at what the light is doing to the dark out there. And this poem is called Oblivion Care. It's really about the tyrant uh, that, um, the tyranny that, uh, it is to experience the erasure of mind and memory in a person you most love. Oblivion care. Censorship, crammed prisons, unmarked boneyards, the garrote, border guards under orders shoot on sight. God knows each tyrant tries but can't smash every single whisper from each tongue or torch all surviving cardboard shoeboxes tied in twine and shoved behind Sunday China with their family freight of, say, photos of young lost uncles grinning, fists high at picnics decades back and dog-eared begrimed identity cards for causes since reduced to bloody smithereens. A despot could staff the National Library with soldiers to keep generations away from the books, could let galleries of, say, Bosch, Velasquez, Gentileschi, Goya, Molder, flyspecked and leak wrecked, and meanwhile sequester history texts from schools, destroy archives. You get my point, attempt to obliterate all of which Seems right now, I'm sorry, so frankly irrelevant next to what our mother, no longer holding her mind, loses. Where's the resistance? When do we rise up to stop it? Now I'm going to read 
uh, newer work. Um, this poem is about, in part, pronouns. So important. Taking the place of a noun to indicate a self. It's also about how I feel in many ways we are all more deeply verbish than nounish. Um, I don't know what a proverb would be, I guess a proverb. But anyway, this is in that territory. It's called the we of my she. Amanda W. Powell is being likely like you, deeply particular, and we dare, dare we? say multiversal, with, like you, more ideas than time. Queerly cisgendered, in all precarity female, of Christian-ish Euro-American <clears throat> descent, Massachusetts raised, long Oregon adapted, fringily until moderately middle class, that is, scholarshiped, thank you, out of waitering house cleaning office girl, into a white collar, by sheer plod happenstance advantage, she got to be being decades a teaching public servant of two languages and their poetry. Joyously wife wedded, she with beloved are living in a county that shall one day, inshallah, be properly named Kalapuya, not Lane, Ohala. Eager to dance as she is to read and both always, pudgily slender, well-traveled pre-pandemic, deep into carbon debt, she is being a person with birth certificate in safe deposit that might as well declare in the attending physician's spidery copper plate, sheer dumb lucky, as it so baldly does white, while saying as it does nothing about the odd cultural, psycho, neuro, physio, spiritual entanglement in the gene spatter, et cetera. However, Amanda W. Powell's also self-like we can be being a they, like yours, we imagine, somewhat smoke-colored, green vining, obsidian mineraled to move wordlessly synapsed, briny blooded with a milky sap, critterly simple, lung-gilled, finny-limbed, mycelial through familiar and other familyed species which be languages, how ever closer. And um, I'm going to end uh, with a poem that's older, but it wants to be read tonight. Uh, in seven short sections, it's a sort of meditation on having a statewide vote taken on your right to live and what it took to win. Uh, in 1992, the so-called Oregon Citizens Alliance sponsored Ballot Measure 9 to amend the state constitution such that public educational institutions at all levels must instruct, quote, Oregon's youth, that, quote, homosexuality, pedophilia, sadism, and masochism are abnormal, wrong, unnatural, and perverse. Their campaign also compared homosexuality to bestiality and necrophilia. A wave of anti-gay hate crimes swept Oregon at that time, including two murders. These events spurred statewide, door-to-door, -door, grassroots coalition, coalition efforts, including faith communities and diverse ethnic and rural organizing groups. The courage of LGBTQ people and our allies to come out boldly and publicly defeated this and all similar ballot measures that, here in Oregon, followed thenceforth every two years for a decade. At the time of the campaign against Ballot Measure 9, Diane and I had just arrived to teach at the University of Oregon, hired as a couple. One. Oh, it's called Wanting the Good. 
one. My hand at your neck, perverse. Our eyes finding each other along the pillow, unnatural. A smile begun before we're awake, abnormal. Our bodies milky and sallow, freckled and still, wrong. Want to do something perverse and unnatural? We grin over the breakfast or supper dishes. If you are squeamish, don't prod the beach rubble, whispers Sappho in Mary Barnard's translation. The only help I have not to do myself in, unnatural, wrong, at 16, and drawn to a best friend's arms, lifetimes ago, for my students, some of whom must wonder, too. Sappho I had, other than that, just Anias Nin dancing with June, who retreated to Henry Miller as night wore on. Two, from 26 or seven centuries past, from torn papyrus and libraries burned, a fragment that I in high school starred. We shall enjoy it. As for him who finds fault, may silliness and sorrow Three, not dreams, but those husks of near sleep buzz with my mind's exhortation, or one of my minds, on its soapbox claiming our right to live. Yet another insomniac self, hunched at headquarters, plots precinct by ward, by town, by county, while another dials long after other volunteers go home, calling just one more voter to explain finally more than a right to live, but willing to thank her, whatever she says, and get on with it, make the next call. And another mind writes on night pages, definitive letters to editors. My beloved rests weary beside this campaign until I get up to read, heat some milk, call a friend back east where it's already morning. Four, Silliness and indignation overtook a man who jumped on his bicycle to chase you out of the trailer park we leafleted one showery Saturday. Finding fault, he found you at your most Franciscan, smiling and thanking him, that's all, till he took off baffled and I found you shaking, each door stoop done. Five, the day arrives and we're at a polling place with signs, the sun just risen, my sweetheart and sister and I, no on nine, outside Crest Drive Elementary, the requisite 100 feet from the doors, as voters drive up and parents deliver children to school. By far, the majority smile and wave. One woman shrieks from her car, I can't believe you do this in front of the children. We continue to hold our signs and smile and not make love in public or throw things or rage. Six, in the dark, the therapists wear white sashes in case someone caves in if we lose, but we're not losing. Numbers rising, counts in from the counties, a small steady margin for us, and now they know for sure. And you, my love, leap with your arms flung high and cheers of a glee 40 years at least caught in your throat but freed now sorrow wait out there we shall enjoy this seven why did we win every call to a wavering voter each pamphlet dropped on a stoop all the neighbors stopping to chat, the ladies on lunch breaks filling envelopes, talks in temples and churches and school boards. But we know why we won this round, three lemons and a new knife. Never used, a knife you're prepared to throw away, said my sister's godmother, who learned this in Somalia. And it will work, but only for a good thing. Why do I love you completely? Neurobiologists hypothesize homo and hetero brains, geneticists, genes. You've got the looks and you're the wittiest person I know. The real reasons are all here, walking into the woods with three lemons and a cheap knife from Safeway, up behind the cemetery, along a muddy back track over fallen logs, under slow dripping boughs, 
on November 3rd after voting across mosses, treading the spiky, velvet, emerald, rusty softness, the twigs that thread new generations through downed leaves, hushed until you find the perfect spot to do what she said. We cut the lemons with the knife and throw them where they won't be touched. In spongy earth, I bury the knife. We do it as it must be done, wanting a good thing. That and my sister's godmother's prayers of intercession to the saints for this campaign and my mother's petitions with her congregation and your mother's novenas to our blessed lady. These explain the balance tipped to a victory because science and faith agree the truth will out eventually. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amanda, for your moving poetry. And we're really uh, interested now in hearing any questions you might have for our two wonderful readers. So please use the, uh, the function in, through YouTube, um, or we can, you can contact uh, Wendy Beck as well. So um, just feel free to forward those questions. And meanwhile, I just want to make an announcement about our uh, Lane Writers Network um, that's uh, going to have information about both Diane and Amanda on its website. And you will be able to uh, access uh, links, for example, to uh, Diane's uh, wonderful work um, that way. And we also want to put in a special uh, thank you to the Tsunami Bookstore, which has been our wonderful literary bookstore here in town. And uh, the phone number is right below me, as you can see. And we want to give thanks to them because they have supported our critique groups and have, can, have stocked the work of our wonderful writers uh, here in this area. So thank you. And then one other um, announcement before we get to our questions is there will be the reading uh, River Road reading series, which has been going on with great success uh, the last Sunday of the month. And it will be coming up on Zoom and it will be uh, Sunday the 31st at 4.30 p.m. PST. And you can also access the website the way you can our website here. If you can't make that time, you can actually tap in, uh, I believe, later too, because it's being recorded. So uh, so if we have uh, some questions uh, coming to the fore, why don't we just bring everybody into the, the studio now, if we can. Um, and uh, see what we have. Um, I'm while we're waiting. Oh, we have a question coming up here. All right, um, from Tim Dugas. <laughs> question. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, let's see. He just says, "Was the Creek story with Paul at the Spencer Road house? I had many wonderful memory, many memories at that Creek. If it was the newest house, many floating boats." <laughs> yes, yes, it was at the Spencer Creek Ranch. It's the creek down below, down below the house. And uh, yeah, everybody was very impressed with Paul's fishing ex escapades. <laughs> very good. Okay, another question for Diane is, uh, um, this comes from Tazula. Question for Diane, loved your readings. How does your queerness intersect with your landscape love and poetry? Like, is it part of the queerness or the countryness or something else divine? Oh, I that's a great question. Well, the thing about queerness, um, I think that my growing up on, in that place with so much aliveness and so many perspectives i think i i just saw that what they told us about people was like really narrow-minded <laughs> and that 
and that what I learned from the horses and the pheasants and the deer and the owls and the uh, and just the the way that nature works, which I actually learned once I had a dog too, who liked girl dogs, uh, you know, and then, and then my own experience of affection and, and, ha and being a body and having things to say and hear it, it was, it was very wonderfully queer. And then when I got, old enough to look back on it, I was really grateful for that, for being taught that and just remembering it and and thinking about the cattails and what they were probably talking about on the road. So that's a great question. And, and I have a question for Amanda. I was just, it must be wonderful to have a legacy from your mother like that in poetry. Could you talk a little more about, about that and and what it is like to have that. Yeah, that that was that was my whole life. I think uh, it's a common story for women to feel that we may partly be living um, dreams and working toward ambitions that our mothers had that they weren't that they didn't find themselves able to foreground and um and my mother was an english major and um she wrote her whole life um and she wrote wonderful letters and um and went to playwriting workshops and and in her retirement she really did focus on poetry and i don't know if she's uh listening to this now or might later but uh her poetry teacher was jesse brown in Arlington and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and um, so my but my mother and my mother read me poetry from you know the get go. I read her a poem as uh, by phone because I couldn't go to be with her as she was dying this past March because of the pandemic. But I I read her a poem as she was on her deathbed. So that was it was a connection that um, was part of the blood that be, that we shared. That's wonderful. I'm putting, I'm putting together a collection of her poems. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I had the privilege of having met your mother, and it's wonderful to hear that. Um, a, a question, too, for Diane. This some came up somewhat earlier, but um, do, you, do you try for different things in your poems, and, and you know, in contrast to what you try to, to do in your, your stories or they're, they're very similar types of things you're, you're working toward or how do you do that? Um, I think that with the poems, when I, I'm a musician as well. So one thing that happens with the poems, one thing that actually happens with all my writing is the sound of it. In fact, it took me a long time in college to start really taking the content seriously <laughs> when I would write papers. But um, I think that um, with the poetry, I have a kind of a sound form that's more tightly imagined. And they all also don't, they can be a little more glancing, I guess. Whereas when I write a story, I always, well, I usually have to, I have to get the voices into it. Mm -hmm. And I have to make the plot, I have to try to find the plot mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what happens. But one thing about me, is that just about anything I write is, I mean, even when I write what some people might think is a very heady academic paper, I'm usually listening to how it's moving and how it sounds to make it feel like it's telling the truth. So anyway. Very good. 
Uh, here's a question for both of you, and I'll, I'll go to Amanda and then, then again with uh, Diane. But there's a question from Elizabeth Howard. It says, question for both Diane and Amanda, what is inspiring you most these days? Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why I read that, that, that last poem. You know, the door to door, what it takes, what it takes. To... I have a wonderful mentor and I tell her often, you know, how lucky I am to have her, to have, um, to have the life I have, the wife I have. And she says, well, that's true. And it takes hard, it takes a lot of work to be that lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, for our positive changes, for the things we want to bring about, you know, it takes a lot of work. They did a lot of work in Georgia. Um, mm. My every hat I have is off to that. So, yeah, what we can do together that we can't do alone—that's really mm. inspiring me. Yeah, and and, and Diane. Mm -hmm. Well, and the. Re the resilience, the resilience of, you know, of those little smelts trying to keep coming up those rivers and the resilience of this amazing reading that Wendy, that you guys at the library, you know, so we're in the middle of this pandemic and like keeping, keeping my self, reminding myself of the resilience, you know, of, of the way that, that the world wants to come back and be for it, each other. And, and it's not just humans, but humans are part of it. And uh, so I think that in the, even in the midst of the pandemic, which could get me pretty down really, but it's so clear. Here we are in these little boxes. And, you know, we figured this out within two weeks. You know, these little boxes that people are trying to hang in with each other and connect with each other. You know, just the way that the little spawning salmon are trying to make their way up around Wenatchee at the Upper Columbia. And we're all part, that's, that's what I keep trying to follow, be part of that. The, the commentary we've been getting while both of you have been reading shows how much you've been inspiring exactly what you said, both of you. Um, there, there's a question here for Amanda, could you speak could speak more about how you learned the lemon and knife ritual and ritual practices, protection and celebration in your activism? Hales, that's a great question. Hey, Sula and Hales. Um, I, well, I talked to my sister's godmother and she said, well, I hear, here's what you can do. <laughs> You know, you, you gotta go, it's gotta be a brand new knife and you only use it that once and you never use it again. And I'm I'm willing to uh, follow instructions. You know, if someone says, hey, this might help, I'll try it. Um, you know, I'll call the, I'll call the Carmelite nuns out on the edge of town, out on Green Hill Road and ask them to pray. I mean, it can't hurt, right? You can't get too much help. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that, um, but that, but I don't say it, I mean, I say it lightly, but not frivolously. Um, um, I, 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 I need ritual. It's been one of the hardest things in the pandemic and going through a major death in the family without ritual and gathering. Um, and I need celebration and um, I love your, I love your question. I think, um, I, I do, uh, find ways to have that. And I, um, and I, you know, I tried in the, in the biographical blurb poem, the we of my she, I try to give a sense of, um, that, 
being of beings. Whatever it is I pray to, that's it's the being of beings. It's the energy we share that we can always draw on. Um, and so ritual and, and ritual practices and um, seeking protection and asking for encouragement when it's running out, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm running out of it, those, that is, if, if activism, for me, if activism didn't have those things, it, then it's, it's running on empty. I guess that's my answer. Yeah. That's so, great. That's a good question. Uh, Wendy, do you have anything you want to forward on in terms of questions? No, nobody uh, asked me a question in okay. email. I think they just felt okay. comfortable asking in YouTube. So. Okay. I have a couple more, um, and then maybe we'll we'll round it up. Um, I I was wondering from Diane if you could speak a little more about the impact of uh, horses in your life and uh, the impact it's had on your writing. I mean, it was so poignant to hear you describe that. Oh. Well, horses are amazing, and I... I grew up on the ranch from when I was nine with this one horse that was the horse, Sheba. And she's remained um, a very important presence for me. But I've had some dogs too, you know, that are similar, like they're, they're guides. I find that um, I had a rough time figuring out how to navigate people, but I was much better with horses. And it was so, it was just such a gift that my, that my parents, I think it was mainly my dad, they didn't know anything about horses, but I wanted a horse and somehow they just got this horse, this young spirited horse when I was nine. And she, but she had a really good personality. She was very kind. Now it took me a few struggles to figure out how to be with her, but I learned so much and she went along with it. And I, I guess that's kind of what I learned about with horses. And then when we got more horses, it's just so fun to watch animals relate to each other. They're so interesting. And then when I was, I was a nun for a while, and then I had a deer for a while that I rescued. And I just learn a lot from animals. It's really, it's really useful for me to watch them even the birds in the backyard to just watch them and try to see how they, how they do with each other. And they have a lot of wisdom. So anyway, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I sort of was raised by horses. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, a question, then we'll probably close with this, a question for you both from Tim Paradis. Do you, uh, we'll start with Amanda. Do you think the descent into ir irrationality of a significant segment of our society reflects a lack of meaning and poetry in your lives? How can poetry be made more accessible? Absolutely, they need more poetry. There's no question about that. <laughs> poetry is what's, you know. Poetry is it. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's the answer. I, um, for a long time, I, I taught uh, an intro to poetry course, occasionally, uh, it was Spanish poetry, um, yeah, but it's all the same thing. Um, and I would tell my students, you've got to learn to memorize. I mean, it's, uh, I would tell them, it's, it's not, it's in fact not possible to live a fully satisfied and self-realized life without deeply understanding Baroque sonnets. And we can't let that happen. So, you know, you've come to the right place. We're gonna deal with that. And you must 
learn to memorize some poetry because I tell them, you know, okay, you could be, you know, you could be stuck somewhere. Someone they might go. Oh, um, what are you going to do if you're ever in jail, and they take away your stuff? You got to have something in your head. You got to, you got to be ready. So, uh, poetry keeps us ready and making it more accessible. It's perfectly accessible. Just stop teaching that it's something arcane and difficult and away from us. So th events like this. And remember that songs are poetry and we all need to sing and we all love to sing. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you both. This is just wonderful to to hear you both and the questions and answers and your readings. It just it's been a wonderful, rich experience. Um, and we just want to uh, remind you that that next month we will be having a reading uh, from Susan Moore and from David Bradley. Susan will be reading her poetry, and David Bradley will be reading his prose. Um, and it, again, it's been such a wonderful experience to have these pairings of, of such um, richly storied people. Um, Thank you so much, all of Wendy, you, for, for doing this. It's just such a treat. And we get a ton of good feedback at the library because people can watch this after on YouTube. And it's always, you know, we'll get emails or in a phone call, somebody will be calling about something else and say, oh, I caught windfall poetry. And, it was just so inspiring. I've been thinking about it all week. So know that this will resonate on and on, and we really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you again. And uh, thanks. We'll look forward to seeing you again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye.